Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hi, everyone. I am recording this podcast on the day of a very special anniversary. Profile America, Friday, June 5th. One of the most important battles in history began 65 years ago tomorrow, as Allied forces invaded the French coast at Normandy on D-Day. The landing began an 11-month campaign to break the German stranglehold on Europe. The landing, codenamed Overlord, has been celebrated in countless books and movies. It was a gigantic gamble, counting on both the weather and secrecy to hold until Allied forces had established a beachhead. Almost 7,000 naval vessels took part in the operation. During World War II, some 16 million U.S. men and women were in uniform. Just under 3 million veterans from that era survive today. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. I've written a brief blog post about D-Day that includes an article that appeared in the Yorkshire Post about how the memory of World War II is kind of slipping through the cracks of time and how many young people today don't even realize which of their family members may have served in World War II. Well, just about all of us had someone in our family who served in the war, and those that didn't certainly fought the good fight on the home front. In my own family, my grandfather's brother, uh, Elsie Cecil Moore, who we called Uncle Elsie, he participated in the invasion of Normandy, and he received the Bronze Star for that because he took a shot to his shoulder during the invasion. And actually, shortly after that, he received his second Purple Heart for a shot that he received through his face. You know, growing up, I always noticed the scar on his chin. I thought it was kind of a cute dimple, but I didn't realize until later when I started asking questions about our family history that it was actually a bullet wound. My grandmother, Pauline Moore, and her husband, my grandpa, who was uh, designated as 4F during the war due to a, a medical condition, they worked at the Kaiser Shipyards in Richmond, California, not too far from where I live. And they were building the Navy ships that sailed the Pacific. And Pauline was actually not a Rosie the Riveter, but rather she was a secretary for the dockyard manager for yard number two at Kaiser Shipyards. And so that meant that she helped in the hiring process, um, hiring all of those Rosies that had to leave their homes and join the workforce. And in fact, when the yard finally closed down at the end of the war, My grandmother was the last woman through the gates of yard number two, which is something she was very proud of. And like so many women, she sacrificed time with my dad, who was born in 1939, and he wasn't even in school yet. But she often told me that she really, really enjoyed working at the shipyards because she really felt like everybody was pulling together and she was making a difference. So I encourage you to check out the posting D-Day Anniversary on the Genealogy Gems news blog. You'll find a link there to that great article from the Yorkshire Post, as well as a video. Uh, It shows the events of D-Day. Just music, no words. Nobody needs to explain it to you. You just watch it, and it's, it's very, very compelling. So thank God that those brave young men were willing to fight for our freedom. Well, today in the news, uh, we've got some news from the Genealogy Conference front. There are several great events coming up this summer of 2009. First is the Family History Expo in Loveland, Colorado. It's just outside of Denver. And that's coming up next weekend, actually, already June 12th and 13th of 2009. But it's not too late to make plans to attend. So you can head to fhexpos.com, and I'll have a link directly to the page for the Loveland Expo in the show notes, and you can get more information and register there. And then the Southern California Genealogical Jamboree is going to be held in Burbank, California, 
on June 26th through the 28th of 2009, which I'll be attending. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I'll be teaching two classes on Google, a beginning and an advanced. And I will also be on the panel for the Son of a Blogger Summit with Dick Eastman and Steve Danko and Dear Myrtle and George Morgan and lots of other great genealogy bloggers. And when I'm not doing that, I'm actually going to be at the Family Tree Magazine booth in the exhibit hall. So I hope that if you make it to the Jamboree that you stop on by and say hi. I'd I'd love to chat with you. And you can get more information about the Jamboree at the Jamboree 2009 blog. It's at genealogyjamboree.blogspot.com. And you can also register at the Southern California Genealogical Society website at s cgsgenealogy.com. And I will have a link directly to the Jamboree 2009 webpage in the show notes. Also this summer will be the 29th Annual International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies. Uh, They're having their international conference on Jewish genealogy. It's being held August 2nd through the 7th of 2009 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And you can register at the IAJGS website at philly2009.org. And they're actually having a a neat deal. Um, For anybody under the age of 21, um, they can register for the entire conference for just $50. Great deal and a great way to get young people involved in genealogy. And then at the end of the summer, I am going to be at the next Family History Expo, which is going to be in Salt Lake City, Utah. That's going to be fun. I mean, my gosh, (laughs) right there next to the, you know, near the Family History Library. It's going to be wonderful. That's August 28th and 29th of 2009. And again, you can head over to FamilyHistoryExpos.com or FHExpos.com. And I will again have a link directly to the Salt Lake City Expo webpage in the show notes. And now as we uh, take a look at new records that are coming out, they continue to come out fast and furious. Uh, In May of 2009, Family Search announced that it has published millions of records from the southern states to its free online collection. I love this. I have lots of southern ancestors. It's a tough search sometimes, depending on, on the record availability. And as much as can come online, all the better, I'd say. Uh, they've got millions of death records from North Carolina. Those cover 1906 to 1930. They've got South Carolina, 1915 to 1943, uh, and they have a small index that goes from 1944 to 1955 for those records. And they also have some new Florida death records available as well. Viewers can search the free collection on the Record Search Pilot, and you just go to FamilySearch.org and click Search Records and then click Record Search Pilot. And actually, over the past 18 months, Family Search has actually published digital images and indexes from lots of southern states. Fueled by over 100,000 online volunteers, Family Search is digitizing and indexing historical records and publishing them online. And the most recent ones that they've been working on are Alabama statewide deaths, 1908 to 1974. That's an index. Arkansas County Marriages, this is wonderful, 1837 to 1957. Civil War Pension Index Cards, they've got digital images for those. Florida Deaths from 1877 to 1939. Florida State Censuses, 1855, 1935, and 1945. you got to love being able to get into those state census records. Those are great. Um, Also, Georgia deaths, 1914 to 1927. They had the Louisiana War of 1812 pension list. North Carolina, Davidson County marriages and deaths from 1867 to 1984. Uh, They have Texas death. They have an index for Texas deaths, 1964 to 1998. And then they have records, um, 1890 to 1976. And finally, in West Virginia, they have births from 1853 to 1990. Marriages from 1853 to 1970, which is an index, and deaths from 1853, um, index all the way through 1970. And Family Search has also published um, recently free indexes to the 1850, 1860, 1870, 1880. 
1900 and 1920, which is a partial index for the U.S. Census. All are important sources for Southern states' research. And David E. Rencher, who you may have heard, was recently uh, announced as the new chief genealogical officer for Family Search. He put out a statement saying that there is much more to come, which is really nice to hear. He says Family Search has a large collection of records on film from the southern states that will need to be digitized, indexed, and made available for the public online, and that they are acquiring new records all the time. So that's very good news. And there's a couple of other new collections they've gotten started on in the indexing process. They're working on births for Trelawney, Jamaica from 1878 to 1930. Also in the indexing process now is Mexico records from 1930, Rhode Island, 1920, the U.S. Federal Census, and the 1920 U.S. Federal Census for Vermont. And they've recently completed indexing on Arkansas County marriages from 1837 to 1957, as well as North Dakota, the 1920 U.S. Federal Census. And I guess when they get completed in the indexing process, they're actually taken off the website, and then they're prepped for full publication on the record search website. So you want to be keeping an eye out for those that have just been recently finished. And right after this, we're going to head into something new over at Genline and Swedish Research. You know, I love bringing these genealogical gems to you that help boost your research and build a strong family tree. And it's important to me to always have free podcasts available so that everyone can participate. If you enjoy these free shows and you would like to help me cover the costs of bringing them to you each week, there's a really easy way to do that that won't cost you a thing. By coming to my website at genealogygems.tv whenever you need to do some shopping online and accessing your favorite stores and websites through the links that you find on my site, you financially support the show. The price you pay is exactly the same, but Genealogy Gems receives a small percentage for referring you. It's just that simple. Amazon is one of my all-time favorite places to shop online. They have just about everything and at incredibly competitive prices. So next time you're looking for books, DVDs, software, electronics, apparel, pretty much anything at all, head to genealogygems.tv and click the Amazon ad that you find on the homepage or throughout the website. And these free podcasts will benefit by any shopping that you do and you will get the same super low prices. Everybody wins. So if you enjoyed the Genealogy Gems podcast and the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast, let your mouse do the shopping through the ads and links on the Genealogy Gems website, and together we'll keep new episodes coming for a long time to come. I recently had a chance to interview Kathy Mead, who is the U.S. rep for the Swedish genealogical records company Genline.com for the Family Tree Magazine podcast. And that interview is going to be in the June 2009 episode that'll be coming out around June 15th, 2009. But after we concluded that interview, Kathy told me that they were going to be coming out with a new service. And uh, so we took a few extra minutes to chat about that. Now that the service is online, I can share this extra conversation that Kathy and I had about Genline's new transcription service and give you all the details. So here's my conversation with her. Well, I've got Kathy Mead here with me from Genline.com. Welcome, Kathy. Okay, good afternoon. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And I and I know that you have been really busy between the, the conferences going on in Raleigh, and you had some folks in town from Sweden and from Genline as well, didn't you? You've kind of been on the grand tour for Genline. Yes, that's right. Uh, last week, uh, for about 10 days, the CEO of, of Genline, Miko Onan, and then also Peter Balansko, the former CEO and now a board member, plus uh, David Vogelberg, the designer, were in town for uh, just to sort of visit Genline customers, and we gave a presentation at Arlington Heights Library here in Chicago, in the Chicago area. Then we went to Minnesota, gave a presentation to the Swedish Minnesota Genealogical Group, plus sort of toured a couple of places where we have uh, a lot of Genline customers, and then they went to Lindsberg, Kansas, which, as you may know, is a Swedish settlement, 
And while they went there, I flew on to North Carolina to the NGS conference where they met me for Friday and Saturday. So it was a nonstop tour, and they met lots of customers. It was the first time for two of the gentlemen to really sort of see the genealogy community in the States versus in Sweden. That's great. Um, What kind of differences might they come across, do you think? Well, the biggest thing was the NGS conference. Yeah. Because in Sweden, they have one national conference, and they attract about 5,000 people. Oh, my. It's a very big event and lots of traffic in the exhibit hall. So they were quite surprised at how little the traffic was in the exhibit hall at NGS. Now, there were 1,500 people who registered for the conference, but the exhibit hall was sort of empty many times during the day. I think the biggest difference, though, between the conference in Sweden and here is in Sweden, they really go there for the the vendors. A lot of the genealogy societies have tables, and that's where people go to. They just they don't have as many presentations, so it's not really a conference per se, as NGS is a conference as well as FGS. Yeah, that's probably an interesting balance to try to strike between the educational component and the fact that um, when you go to a conference like that, it's kind of your one chance to really. Uh, be up close and personal with the folks who are out there putting out new information and new resources. So I could appreciate that. Yeah, it was sort of an eye opener for two of the men. And their conference is uh, once a year, like you say. And is genealogy picking up an in interest in Sweden as it has been in other places like Great Britain? Oh yes, we have about fifty thousand customers in Sweden that are you know active researchers, you know very serious researchers, and the population is only nine million people. Yeah, that's a lot. So, you know, there are more and more people that are getting into genealogy. Practically, there's about between 250 to 300 libraries in Sweden actually subscribe to Genline. Wow. And then how would that compare with over here in the States? Here in the States, we have about around 25 or 30. That, And then all the family history libraries subscribe to Genline. But here, the reason being is that... Uh, Swedish genealogy is a niche market, mm-hmm. meaning there's probably only 3 to 5% of the population that has Swedish heritage, whereas in Sweden, you know, a large percentage uh, would, what would be excluded are probably the million people that have immigrated to Sweden during the last 50 years. Right. So 8 million people. So that part here, where in this country, market for Genline at a library would be libraries that specialize in genealogy research such as the Houston Public Library, Mm -hmm. or libraries that actually have a a large Swedish-American community around here in the Chicago area or maybe in Minnesota, museums that specialize in Swedish-American culture, such as the Swedish-American Museum in Chicago, the um, American Swedish Historical Museum in Philadelphia are examples, the Swenson Center, uh, the Center for Swedish Immigration Studies in at uh, Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois. Those are some of our customers. So that is the difference because a lot of libraries here in this country are constrained on their revenue resources, and they really have to serve the entire population. So ancestry, you know, would be the one that sort of fits most people's needs and is sometimes difficult to justify getting a subscription to a database that only serves a few people. Right. But certainly when you do have Swedish ancestors, it seems to be the place to go. I mean, it's amazing the amount of records that you have. I know it's growing every day. And and didn't you announce a new service when you went to the Raleigh conference? You know, one of the challenges in dealing with Swedish records is they're in Swedish. <laughs> and so many of us obviously don't speak Swedish. And uh, tell us about the new service that you launched that might be able to help us out. Yeah, yes. We've added a new feature to our Genline Family Finder for Windows, and it's called a transcription feature. So when a user is looking at a record, they can actually transcribe the record. They would push an icon, and then up comes a form, and they actually transcribe the record as it is on the record. So if it's a birth record, they can put down the child's name, the parent's name, and then also the birth date and the baptism date. Then they save it. And then it is actually accessible to other people by doing a person name search. So as more and more people do this, then there's a capability of having a name search feature that's quite good. Now, again, 
what can happen is somebody might transcribe it wrong. So the next person might come along and they might look at it and they might put in there, they can actually say, well, this is how the record should be transcribed. So there could be two transcriptions for that same record, but then another person looks at it and says, okay, this one is right, and they can actually save it again. And what you will have is a process of more or less people voting and saying, okay, 10 people have agreed that this is a good record. So when they go and do the name search, they will see how many people have voted and said, yes, this is, uh, I agree with this particular transcription or interpretation. And again, you know, you can look at the record and you can verify it. So it's just another helping tool where the user community is really helping transcribe the records. So, Kathy, just to, to back up a step, up until now, did you have a searchable index for folks to be able to come in and put a name in and try and see if they were there? Or did they have to kind of go straight to that parish record and comb through and look for those names? We did not have a name search before. Essentially, you had to know the parish, and we're still recommending people know the parish. Yeah. But primarily, the way it worked is you would come in, you would search for the county. If you didn't know the county, you could search all counties and then select the parish. And then after that, you would select the type of record, such as a birth record or a marriage record or a household examination record, and then just do a search. You can also limit it further based on year. That way, that was the only way. Now, with this way, this is another way of possibly sort of saying, okay, you know, I do know the parish, but I can't seem to find the record. And maybe you can look at the name search and say, see if someone else has found the record for you already. So really, you're getting a, an opportunity for your users to participate in improving the website and making it more searchable more quickly, it sounds like. That's correct. Oh, that's great. And also just to recap, the Genline Family Finder 3.0, that's the tool, isn't it, on your website that people browse and print and and interact with the records. Is that right? That's correct. And what they have to do is they can go to our website and they can download that for free. There's no charge to download it. And then they can actually sort of demo it. Now, they probably won't see any of the name search capabilities in the demo version mm-hmm. because there's just limited data on the, on the demo version. But because as they get into the, the actual finder itself and they're going to see the transcription there, and hopefully if somebody has already worked with the record, they may have put in their version of it, transcribed it. But then you can also add yours if, you're, if you don't agree with that, correct? That's correct. Oh, that's great. It really kind of brings in that Web 2.0 of getting people to interact together to improve the information that they're finding online. Right. Yes, there's a a little bit of that in in the process. Thanks so much to Kathy Mead from Genline.com for joining us here on the show. You can visit with Kathy in person at some of the great genealogy conferences that are coming up that I mentioned earlier in the show. She's going to be at the Family History Expo in Loveland, Colorado, which is just outside of Denver, on June 12th and 13th of 2009, as well as many of the future Family History Expos. And she'll also be at the Southern California Genealogical Jamboree in Burbank, California, June 26th through the 28th. So stop by her booth and tell her that you heard her interview on the Genealogy Gems podcast. You know, in the last couple of days, I have noticed people talking about a website. It was called Paper of Record. Now, I know that several months ago, Paper of Record was acquired by Google And it was to become part of the Google News Archive. But for some reason, and there are varying ideas on this, paper of record just seemed to fall off the face of the earth. It it just no longer appeared on the Internet. And that caused a lot of furor with people who had really become dependent on the great records that they had at paper of record, which seemed to focus mostly on, on booklets and newspapers and that type of thing. Well, just recently, I got an email from the World Vital Records folks, they, and they put in their newsletter that they were now providing access to those paper of record records that are now available through Google through their website. And um, so I went and checked Google News Archive, and it does appear that paper of record resources are now available again. And that's a great gem for all of us. But there's a little bit of confusion about whether they are all available for free 
from Google News Archive or whether World Vital Records has some kind of special access to some of them and therefore makes it a value added to their paid subscription site. I've actually got an email into World Vital Records to try to discern that because I'm curious to know if they have access to some records that are not going to be on the Google News Archive. But right now, they have um, a good deal of the paper of record images available and many more coming up. So I wanted to tell you about that, tell you how to access it. And it kind of dovetails in with the video that I produced on the Google News Archive, because that is the way that you're going to be accessing these records. So I'm going to have a link in the show notes for this episode um, that takes you directly to the news archive search, and it takes you to a page which lists the content that Google acquired from Paper of Record. There are lots and lots of titles available. In particular, if you have Canadian ancestors or ancestors that immigrated to the U.S. through Canada, you'll find lots of Canadian newspapers and materials on there that are available for the first time since um, Paper of Record was acquired by Google. But there are lots of other resources here as well, and I'm just looking through them. Some of them um, look like they're from French Canada. Uh, Lots of those, actually, as I'm scrolling down this list. And, of course, Quebec. And um, definitely an emphasis on Canada because the original owner and creator of Paper of Record was located in Canada. So no surprise there. But also they have a list of the titles that were acquired but are still being processed for display. And what that means is is that Google has them. They acknowledge they have these records, but they're going to be coming up probably over the next three months. So throughout the summer of 2009, you'll start to see some of these additional ones. And these you'll find are coming more out of Mexico, Colombia, South America, still some more Canadian ones, but you're going to find more diversity in the types of records that you would find in this second phase of records that'll be coming out over the next three months. And then there were just a handful of specific titles that were previously available at Paper of Record that Google doesn't have the rights to display, at least not yet. They write here that we have reached out to the content owners of these titles, but not all want to participate in Google's programs. So for this list of titles, you may need to visit a library to access them if you're unable to find an online source, or you can contact the publisher directly. So some of the ones that they had trouble with actually were coming out of Australia. The Perth Courier, the McLeod Gazette, the Fort McLeod Gazette, Sporting News, and there's also the Israel Light and Israel Facts and the Gazette Bulletin. So there's a handful there that maybe the folks who hold the copyright to these materials will eventually give them the rights to be able to display them on the Google News Archive. But for right now, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So overall, you've got the bulk of the materials that came out of paper of record available now through the News Archive, and you'll see more and more of those as the summer progresses. And to learn more about how to use Google's News Archive, which is just a tremendous tool, I'm going to have a link in the show notes that will take you to my Google News Archive timeline video. That shows you not only how to access all those terrific newspapers and articles that are available through the News Archive, but also how to put them in a timeline format so that you can get a sense of when things were happening and you can zoom in on a particular decade or even a particular year. And I even gave you an example with um, some research that I was doing in England and how I actually located materials from the other side of the world (laughs) that had to do with the events of my ancestors or my husband's ancestors in England back in around 1895. So check that out. It's the Google News Archive timeline. And uh, hopefully we're going to see lots and lots of new records coming online over the next couple of months. So check it out. Would you like to boost your genealogy research and break through those brick walls? Well, here's your answer. Become a Genealogy Gems premium member. You'll get two extra members-only episodes every month packed with great tips that you can use right away and instructional videos walking you through the best internet tools step-by-step. In the current series called Google, a goldmine of genealogy gems, I'll show you how to get the most out of Google. If you enjoy the Genealogy Gems podcast, then you're going to love being a Genealogy Gems premium member. 
This is Tim Cox. I'm a premium member, and I have been for a while. just wanted to call and let you know that I really enjoyed being a premium member, and one of the perks I like about it is the videos. I learned how to build my own genealogy dashboard. The videos were called Google, a gold mine of genealogy gem, and because I made that dashboard, I'm able to monitor all the blogs and the websites that interest me, and I was able to create tabs. So each tab has different topics and just go to each one I want. This is like the best thing since sliced bread. So Lisa, thank you for what you're doing and I really do enjoy your podcast. To become a premium member, go to my website at genealogygems.tv and click the join today button. And by entering the special coupon code SAVE20, that's S-A-V-E-2-0, you'll get 20% off the annual membership. Genealogy Gems Premium Membership. It's where you belong. Gosh, where does the time go? I can't believe it. This episode is already coming to a close. I want to thank you so much for joining me today on this episode. I want to thank my special guest, Kathy Mead from Genline.com. And of course, I encourage you to head out to all the genealogy conferences coming up this summer. Check out the Google News Archive timeline video that I put together for you and uh, hopefully start accessing some of those new records that are available for free that come from the original paper of record website. And of course, I invite you to sign up for my free Genealogy Gems e-newsletter. It's a great way to stay on top of what's coming up on the podcast, some behind-the-scenes things, and always a couple of little gems in there that I just don't get to on the show, but that hopefully will give you a little boost in your research. Just head to my website, genealogygems.tv, and click on the newsletter button on the left-hand column. And of course, the big bonus is when you do sign up for the free e-newsletter, you're going to get a link sent to you for my e-book. This is a 20-page book on five fabulous Google strategies for the family historian. I think that you'll really enjoy it. There's lots of great nuggets in there that you can start using right away. And that's free just for signing up. And of course, we do value you signing up for the newsletter and your privacy, and we do not share your email with anybody. And of course, I really appreciate your support for the podcast. Share it with your friends, you know, blog about it, talk about it on Facebook. If you hear something that works well for you, chances are it's going to help out somebody that you know. And I would greatly appreciate it if you pass on the word, get the word out there that genealogy podcasts have something to offer everyone and tell them how to get here. Of course, the website, genealogygems.tv. And uh, when you get the newsletter, you'll see links there. I hope that you'll um, become a fan of Genealogy Gems on Facebook. And, of course, also follow me on Twitter. Yes, I'm Twittering. (laughs) Uh, I'm not typing about what I'm having for breakfast, that kind of thing. I, I don't quite get into that. But it is a great way to get some updates on what I'm working on, who I'm talking to, and when new blogs and podcast episodes come out. So you can follow me on Twitter. So that's about it for now. Until next time, thanks for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.